Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5. If you don't uh, have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. Uh, We would love for you to be able to use that. That's what they're there for. And if you don't have a Bible, then uh, we invite you just to take one of those. We would uh, love for you to have the Word of God. Let it be part of your life day in and day out. Hey, I hope you were aware that yesterday was Valentine's Day. You guys aware of that? It was. And, and, and Valentine's Day is a day when our culture celebrates the ideas of love and romance and not being alone. Right? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a day that uh, society sets aside to force men to purchase uh, candy and flowers and jewelry so that they can, you know, be someone's soulmate or find a soulmate uh, and then we can all live happily ever after. Right? So, I mean, that's the way that it's all set up. And so, uh, happy Valentine's Day, uh, by the way. Uh, But truthfully, we really do take this heart stuff seriously, don't we? Uh, As a culture, as a society, uh, you know, our language, our visuals, our kind of just everything is attached to the heart. So, when we're talking about people, and if they're a really good guy or a really good uh, uh, woman, then we say, you know, oh, this person has what? A heart of gold. Yeah, wow, you know, heart of gold. They're just a great person. And, and, uh, and, and of course, we oftentimes give terrible, unbiblical counsel to people, right? Especially young people. We say stuff like, just follow your heart. Yeah, <laughs> you ever read the Bible? It doesn't really encourage that. So, uh, and, and then there's that whole world of romance, you know, because I heart you, right? I, I, I love you with all my heart. I love you with all my heart and, and, until that is that you break my heart. But that's okay because my heart will go on. So, you know, we, we, some of you are like, whoosh, didn't even get that. It's all right. It's all right. We immerse our language, our imagery in in all this stuff about the heart. And the truth is, God created our hearts, and he says a lot about them too. For instance, in Matthew 22, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And of course, the Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So obviously, the heart's really important if we're supposed to love God with all of it. And and it's part of that equation that leads us into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. But that's not all it has to say about the heart. For instance, Prophet Jeremiah, this is so encouraging, he said, the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately sick or wicked. That's encouraging, isn't it? Or how about Jesus echoing the prophet when Jesus said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. And they come out of the heart. Wow, if if that's what's in your heart, I'm not sure I really want you to hurt me. Right? Right? And yet, all that said, our hearts are key to happiness. We're in the series, Are You Happy? We're looking at Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 5, uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's called the Beatitudes, where he's telling us what it really takes to be happy. And he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And what we're looking at tonight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Um, So if we want to be happy, if we want to be blessed in our lives, then we need to have pure hearts. And if we have pure hearts, we're going to see God. So how do we know if we have a pure heart? I I mean, I can't just ask you. You can't just ask me because 
you know, the Bible says the heart's deceitful, so it'll lie to us. Oh, yeah, you're good. All right? Do I have a pure heart? Absolutely. You got a heart of gold. Trust me, I wouldn't lie to you. But the Bible says that it's deceitful, so it'll lie. And it'll always give us a pass, right? And I don't know, but your heart, my heart will always justify what I want to do. It'll always just, yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you deserve it. But that doesn't really make me happy. So how do we know whether or not we have a pure heart? Tonight, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey, and I want to invite you to do a heart evaluation through a vision check. Think about this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, that is, if, if you read through the Beatitudes, that's the strangest promise that's in there. It just is different from all the rest, you know. You get the kingdom of heaven, you inherit the earth, you're comforted, you receive what you give. You know, all that kind of stuff. But this is like, just odd. You'll see God. It's a very tangible kind of visual uh, promise. And, and, and yet it sounds funny because we're going to do a heart evaluation to a vision check. And if you have heart issues and you go to a cardiologist, he never looks at your eyes. You know, he might look you in the eye to tell you you got bad news or something, but he's not going to go, okay, hey, hey, let me look at your eyes to see how your heart is. And yet God kind of says you can tell how your heart is by your vision. Because blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The Apostle Paul in Titus uh, chapter 1, verse 15, kind of developed this thought a little bit. Uh, he says this, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled, nothing is pure. Both their minds and consciences are defiled. Did you catch that? Isn't that interesting? To the pure, to those who have a pure heart, everything is pure. It's all good. But to those who are defiled on the inside... Everything that they look at and see and think about is defiled. So let me ask you this question. What do you see? What do you see? And, and, and by that, I mean, do you see God? Around you, in you, uh, uh, in the midst. Do you see him working? Do you see him active in people's lives? Uh, are your eyes open to his beauty and his power and his goodness and his grace all around you? What do you see in yourself? I, I'm just going to ask you and, and the Holy Spirit to have a conversation right now. Uh, you don't answer me, but, but when you look in the mirror, when you examine your own life, what do you see? Do you, do you see a child of God? A wonderful creation who's gifted and talented as a person? Do, do you see your blessings? And how abundant they are in your life. Do you see how God is working to redeem your life? And, and how he's picked up the broken pieces of your past and, and put it together to, to bless you? Are, are you able to see the power and the beauty of God in you? Or when you look in the mirror, when you see yourself and, and the way you look at your life, do you just see a loser? Do you see a failure? Do you see a victim? Do, do you see all the disappointments in life? Do you see all the mistakes that you've made? Do you see all the losses and, and failures that you've experienced? What stands out to you? When you look in the mirror, do you see someone who's not worthy of being loved by God and anyone else? Or do you see yourself from God's perspective? So what do you see in yourself and what do you see in others? Uh, when you look at the people around you, whether family or friends or strangers, how do you see them? Do you see the best in others? Or are you the one who can always find the worst in someone else? Uh, do you, do you, are you quick to praise their successes? Or are you quick to criticize and condemn their failures and mistakes? What is it that, that leaps out of your mouth because that comes out of the heart, when you encounter other people? Do you see other people as an opportunity to, to serve and help someone in life? Or do you see other people as an obstacle to your happiness? If they would just change, if they would just stop, if they would just you know, fix themselves, then I could be happy. Do you see others as God's creation, dearly loved and deserving of blessings? 
Or do you see people as objects for your use, pleasure, or derision? What do you see? Really? Uh, and, and by the way, when I talk about what do you see when you're looking at others, I, I'm just going to use this as an example. This is because we talk about stuff like this here at Calvary. That, that's one of the reasons that pornography is so evil. And, you know, because a lot of people like to say, oh, it doesn't hurt anybody, and, and it's, you know, there's no victims involved and all that kind of stuff. But let me just tell you something. Uh, one of the things that's so destructive about pornography for you is that it inhibits you from being able to see people as God's creation because it makes them to be objects to be used by you. It dehumanizes them. So that's just one example, but we can go on and on and on with the way things corrupt us and how we see other people. And here's the thing, if you're really honest when, you, when I ask you those questions about how you see others and how you see people, it's going to reveal in you how your heart is. And if you're like me, and you ask yourself those questions honestly, then you get to that place where you go, hey, you know what? My heart is not as pure as I would like it to be. You know what? There's a lot of filth in there. There's a lot of junk in there. There's a lot of corruption in there. And, 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 and I don't want it to be there. But it's there. And like I said, if you're like me, it's in your heart too. Whether you can admit that in front of anybody or not, our hearts are wicked. And they're full of all kinds of evil stuff because Jesus said they were and he would know. And, and so if that's you and you would really like to have a heart that was pure so that you could see God and experience joy. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then I'm going to guess that you know to be happy, you need to have a pure heart, a purer heart than you have right now. And so after doing that heart check through a vision test, then I want to spend the rest of the time talking about how to grow in purity. How to grow in purity. If as a follower of Jesus, you want a purer heart than you have, then let's talk about some, some things we can do to grow in purity. And, and, and I'm not going to give you the usual church answers right here. Because if you grew up in churches like I did, this is the place where the preacher would say, okay, what you need to do is you need to pray more, and you need to you know, read your Bible more, and you need to have a quiet time, you need to come to church more, and, and you need to start doing the stuff that we tell you to do in church more. And, and we just kind of pile on. We're really good at that in churches. We just pile on. More stuff for you to do. And here's the thing. All of those activities are good and healthy activities. But if that's all you're doing is just doing stuff to try it, it doesn't purify your heart. I grew up in churches. I, I know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of people who show up every time the doors open. They do all the stuff they're supposed to do. At least they say they do. But their hearts weren't pure. You say, well, that's judgmental. Well, I'm just telling you what I saw. And, and so they struggle with this, and, and, and we don't want to be like that because there's all kinds of churches all over this world that are holding to a form of godliness and denying the power of God, and we want the power of God. So which means we've got to really kind of take some steps toward growing in purity in our hearts if we're going to see God at work. So what I want to do is I want to share two kind of illustrations for you, kind of two movements in your life. Again, not a magic pill that you can take one time and make everything good. These are, these are a process that you need to go through in your life if you really want to, to have a pure heart and you want to see God. And the more that you embrace these, the purer your heart's going to get, and the more you're going to see God, and, and you're going to experience that joy in your life. So two things that are they're just kind of illustrate the battle that's taking place in your heart, for your heart. So uh, first of all, if you want to grow in purity, you need to walk toward the light. And, and I confess, when I, when I wrote that, I was thinking about a bug's life, you know, when all the bugs are going, don't go towards the light. Um, and if you didn't see the movie, you missed that joke too. So uh, walk toward the light. Here's what Jesus said, John chapter 3. And this is the judgment. 
The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. Here's the reality. We were children of darkness until we had that life-changing encounter with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, and he changed us on the inside and made us go from children of darkness into children of light. And yet we're still living in that dark place. And that light is Christ. And he calls us to move toward the light. But what happens when we move into the light? What happens that, that for us and for other people? Now, you can see, can't you? You can see me, and, and, and I can't see you, but that's okay. You can see, and, and I'm revealed to you. When we walk into the light of Christ, here's what happens. We're already revealed to him, but we see ourselves from God's perspective. We see our sin. Oh, look, my hands are dirty. I need to clean my hands. Oh, 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 look, my my heart is is wicked. I need to cleanse my heart. Uh, My feet take me places that I shouldn't go. I need to change my shoes. I need to be different. And when we walk into the light of Christ, we have one of two choices, one of two reactions that happens. Either we repent and we ask God to change us, or we run from the light. Because we hate the light because our deeds are evil. And we don't want to give up our deeds. I mean, because the darkness is so comfortable, because, you know... I hate to admit this, but when we were, you know, in high school and we were checking out girls, we always had a say, saying that darkness and distance were a girl's best makeup. Because <laughs> you can't see. They made us look pretty good, too. And so we hide in the darkness. And, and, and here's the thing. Even as Christians, even as people who know Christ, we hide in the darkness. We don't like the light because the light means transparency. The light means accountability. The light means that we actually are exposed and people can see the things that we've struggled with. And so a lot of times in churches all across this land, there are people who are singing about the light and who proclaim their love for the light and who worship the God of the light, but they are still living in the darkness. That's why here at Calvary, We embrace transparency and accountability. We're not afraid of the light. In fact, we encourage the light and we want you to walk into the light with us because we're not afraid of your stuff. We're not afraid to talk about the fact that we are messed up people that Jesus Christ has healed and has changed. And yes, we still struggle with the darkness because we're children of the darkness formerly, but now we're children of light and we want to celebrate the fact that God has set us free. And guess what? We don't really care if you know our struggles because we're not listening to you as our judge. We're listening to the one lawgiver and the one judge who forgives us completely. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And his voice is the voice of approval. And guess what he says? When we walk into the light and we repent and we say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. Then he forgives us of all of our sins and he cleanses us. And we celebrate living in the light. But hey, it's uncomfortable because it means you got to repent a lot. When you embrace accountability, it means you have to give up those deeds of the darkness or else your friends are going to call you on it. But it gives you that ability for God to change your life and you to live in joy. So if you want a pure heart, then you've got to walk toward the light. Tonight, are you hanging out in the shadows or are you walking toward the light? Um, Choice is yours, and you guys can turn the lights back on now. Uh, And everybody's like, whoa, light. Now we can see you too. Uh, So if you desire a pure heart, you got to walk toward the light. That's the first illustration. Second one is this. If you desire a pure heart, you got to install the truth filter. Uh, How many of you have running water at your house? 
Okay, those of you that didn't raise your hand, somebody nudge them, wake them up. Because they're like, I was getting really comfortable in the dark. And then you turn the lights back on. Okay, you've got running water at your house here in Havasu. How many of you actually drink the water out of the tap here in Havasu? There's like three hands that went up. Okay, what happened? Did you guys taste buds die in another life? Uh, how, so how come the rest of you don't drink the Havasu water? Okay, it's terrible. What, it, it's nasty. It's nasty. It's poisonous. I, I don't know about poisonous, but, you know, hey, I'll, it'll work for this. Yeah, it's, it's full of junk. So what do, you guys, what do you guys drink? Yeah, filtered water. Or as uh, my little bottle right here says, purified drinking water. Mm. Tastes good. Doesn't have all that chunky stuff. I don't have to chew it like Havasu water. Now, we, we want purified water. We want to filter out the junk. We want to filter out the, the stuff that makes it taste bad. We want to filter out the things that, that we think are disgusting or poisonous. And, and that's just for our water. The heart, according to Jeremiah, is deceitful and wicked and sick. And then the culture that we live in feeds our hearts all kinds of lies. Right? Constantly uh, evil thoughts, wrong desires, you know, all, all of the sexual immorality and lust that's out there that is just being sold to us you know, over and over and over again. You know, uh, you, you know, they tell us you can't even resist you know, the urges that you have because you just got to indulge them. And all the greed and materialism that's out there. And you, know, you want more and it'll make you happy if you get the new stuff. Uh, you know, the vanity and pride, it's all, you, know, you got to be right and you got to win and and it's all about you. And, and you know, we, we poison our kids' lives with all of that and the, the whole messed up body images. I don't know if you guys read this stuff or not, but I, I read way too much things. But now they're, they're actually reporting that kids as young as six and seven are aware of body image and those photoshopped models that are on every magazine. Children, girls that are eight, six years old, are evaluating themselves by unrealistic standards that our society is poisoning their minds with. See, that's messed up. And so we need to filter the nasty stuff from the world that's going to poison our heart. How do we do that? There's one way and one way only, and that is the truth that is found in this book. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, great verse. I encourage you to, to memorize it and let it be part of your life. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Of the heart. In other words... The only filter that's going to set you free from the lies of this world and guard your heart so that it can grow in purity is the filter of God's word. That's why the psalmist said, Thy word I have hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Because it's the filter for our heart. That's why Paul said, Don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That book... So that we'll know what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God actually is. And so, honestly, that's why we encourage you. If you don't have a Bible, take a Bible. We're serious about that. People go, oh, you just say that. No, we give away Bibles all the time. We want you to have the Word of God so you can read the Word of God, so it can change your life, so it can guard your heart. You probably don't know this, but we send out, uh, I say we celebrate recovery, sends Bibles to prisons all over the state. And uh, all an inmate has to do, that's right, you can clap for that, it's really cool. And all an inmate has to do is ask for a Bible, and we send them one. And they took that on because they, they send them life recovery Bibles, and, and they want them to be able to use it and actually do celebrate recovery in prison. And, and, and they keep getting more and more, and they get all these letters from guys that hey, somebody said you'd send us a Bible, will you really? And we just send them Bibles because we know the Word of God can be that filter that can change somebody's life, change their heart. That's why we invite you to read with us. So we do like the 90-day challenge, you know. Uh, you know, read through the Bible in 90 days. And right now I'm in Isaiah. 
Had a guy last week at the 4.30 service. He said, I'm done. Do you want me to turn in my list? And I went, no. Thanks for showing me up, you know. I'm trying to read a little bit ahead, and he finished in like 40 days. I said, you need to get a life. And I uh, <laughs> said, I was sick, and I read ahead, but, you know. And, you know, we want you to read the Word of God. It doesn't matter if you do read it 90 days or nine months or a year or, or if it takes you 10 years. Just read it. Put it in your life. That's why we want you to be in life groups. We want you to be involved in small groups that are studying the Bible and looking at what Scripture says and going, hey, how does this apply to your life? And, and introduce some of that accountability there too. That, that's why we put sermon notes in the, the bulletin. We want you to actually follow along and, and write down a couple of words. Now, it's not the words that we put up there that are important. It's what God says to you that you can write down and say, hey, wait, this is what I need to do. It, it, by the way, we also have life notes in your bulletins. You can take those, and even if you're not in a life group, you can use those as a study guide through the week. You can answer those questions. Use it as a devotion. There's more reading to do in there. We want you to have the opportunity to install a truth filter on your life because we know that's going to lead to life change. And so we encourage you to do that. But we can't do it for you. I can't choose that for you. The only way that you're going to experience the joy and the freedom that Jesus is offering you, the only way you're going to have that blessed life is if you're filtering the lies of this world and protecting your heart. So are you willing to install that truth filter in your life? Or are you just going to keep swallowing the junk, the poison that the world is offering up? Because if you don't have the Word of God as a filter for your heart, you're going to not know the difference between the lies of the world and the truth of God. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How's your heart tonight? Did it check out okay? Are you happy with where you are? Or are you at a place where you need God to change you? Because he wants to fill you with joy and blessings and life abundant. But you got to make those decisions. you got to decide. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us. Thanks for changing our hearts. First of all, through Jesus Christ and the fact that he has forgiven us of all of our sins and promised us eternal life, not because we're good people, but because of his love and his grace. But Lord, tonight we confess how evil our hearts are. And we ask that you would purify our hearts, that you would teach us how to walk toward the light, that we would take the actions to install the truth filter upon our hearts so that you can change us, so that you can set us free, so that we can live in your joy and in your blessings and really, truly be happy. But God, we need your help. We need to hear your voice. We need to see your hands at work in our lives. And so we ask you to change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.